The Steve Lobby Agency presents The Christian Publishing Show, a podcast for writers who want to advance Christ's kingdom using the written word. Here's your host, Thomas Umstadt Jr. What is the difference between a small publisher and a large publisher? And should you go with a small publishing house if given the opportunity? This has been one of our most requested topics on the show, especially after I sent out the survey several episodes ago, and especially after our previous episodes, episode 29, Pros and Cons of Traditional Publishing, and episode 30, Pros and Cons of Indie Publishing. And a lot of authors reached out to me, uh, both over email and in person at writers' conferences, and said, what about small publishing houses? Because what you said about indie and what you said about traditional doesn't really apply to small houses. And I was like, you're right. I need to do an episode on that. And now is the time. But before we talk about small houses specifically, I'd like to kind of explain how traditional publishing works in terms of a business model. I, I've explained this before, but I, I think this really needs to be reiterated. Now, publishing companies act like venture capital firms. They are taking big risks on books, um, and they're expecting to lose money on most of the books that they publish with the expectation that a handful of those books will make so much money that it covers their losses and also brings in a profit. And this is how the market works, right? A tiny fraction of the books make the vast majority of the money. And each publisher is wanting to publish that tiny fraction, but they don't know ahead of time what books are going to be hits, right? It's, it, they guess, they use science, they use measurement, they try, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. And this isn't uh, a dig on any individual publisher. The future is uncertain, right? And so how do you best handle that uncertainty? You bet on lots of books. And you use your best judgment as you bet on those books. So where does the money come from for uh, typical traditional publishers? Well, for most traditional publishers these days, the money comes primarily from their backlist and from their best-selling front list. So if a publisher's got a number one book in its category, they're bringing in so much money from that number one book, it gives them money to take risks on additional new books. But for a lot of publishers, they have really solid evergreen backlists. So for example, HarperCollins owns the rights to the C.S. Lewis backlist. And every time you buy a C.S. Lewis book or audiobook or ebook, HarperCollins gets the majority of that money. That's where the money comes from uh, for their imprints, like Zondervan, to take risks on new books. Some of those new books that Zondervan publishes uh, aren't going to pay back that risk, but they have the money there to take that risk, and they're basically playing with house funds, so to speak. So what is a small house? Well, a small house is like a traditional publishing house, except they don't have that backlist. They don't have that money. They're like a bank with Almost no money in the in the bank. It's kind of like the um, and it's a wonderful life, right? They, there's the run on the bank, and at the end of the day, they have mama dollar and papa dollar, and they go back into the safe and they put those uh, two dollars into the safe. Uh, that that's kind of what small houses are like. They typically don't have an evergreen backlist. Some small houses don't have a backlist uh, of any consequence, right? They're only bringing in a, a tiny amount of money from their backlist, just enough uh, to keep it active. And typically, there's little or no bestseller front list. Uh, so they're, they're, they just don't have a lot of money to work with, and that's why they're small. So uh, not all publishing houses start off small. Some publishing houses are started by an organization, or they get their own investors, and they start off with lots of money. You know, the old saying, how do you make a small fortune in publishing? You start off with a large fortune. Um, that's how a lot of publishing houses uh, got there, right? They started with a lot of money. But there are some medium uh, houses and large houses now that started off as small houses uh, of yesteryear. Uh, but nowadays, uh, most small houses use the same tools that indie authors use. They're printing on demand. They're using freelancers for interior design and for cover design. Um, but they are doing it for you, and they are putting up the money. So I'm talking about traditional houses here. I'm not talking about um, co-publishing or, or subsidy publishing, which in general I don't recommend. Uh, but that is the topic of another episode. Either go full indie uh, or go full traditional is, is my advice. Um, often uh, small houses are started by an author or a successful author or an agent. 
who wants to help her friends get published. This is the most common that I see, at least in Christian publishing, uh, where the small houses are found. And um, often that single person, that charismatic founder, manages most of everything. In fact, I know of small houses where that single person does everything. They do the editing, they do the cover design, they do the interior layout, they do the typesetting, they do the proofing, they are, and they're working themselves to the bone and often making almost no money, sometimes making exactly no money, <laughs> and they're working um, for minimum wage, sometimes less. It's, it, it is a rough job running a small house. And I've actually consulted with publishers who run small houses, and they're often wondering, should I even continue running this small house or not? They're not all like that. Some of them are more successful. And there's, of course, a continuum, right? Small. I, I'm, while I'm putting uh, publishers into these three categories of small, medium, and large, there's a lot of variation, right? There are small houses that are doing better than others, right? There's some small houses that are on the brink of bankruptcy and other small houses that are on the brink of transitioning into a medium-sized house because they've had a couple of hits. Uh, so one thing I think that's important to differentiate is also how small houses are different from medium houses. I'm not going to do an episode on medium houses, uh, medium-sized publishers, because in most respects, medium publishers act just like traditional publishers. Uh, the, the main difference is the size, the backlist, right? The size, the advance. But they're still – they medium house still has really good best-selling books in their backlist. They have these evergreen titles that are keeping them funded. Uh, so once you get to that point where you have really solid – evergreen backlist, it's almost impossible to go out of business because you have just like guaranteed revenue of this classic that you published 20 years ago that brings in $50,000 a year. And you have, you know, 10 of those, right? So that's a half a million dollars that comes in every year that covers all of your expenses and just makes operating your business uh, much safer, right? And half a million dollars isn't a lot, right? That doesn't put you into big house territory, but it does put you into, we're not like wondering how to pay the electric bill territory. Uh, and another thing that's important to realize with big houses, medium houses, the big houses poach authors away from the medium houses all the time. In fact, for at least one of the top houses, this is their primary strategy, much to the chagrin of those medium houses. They look at the medium houses and they kind of pull away their very top authors every year. And they kind of treat the medium Medium houses like the minor leagues in a, a professional um, baseball. So you have a professional baseball team and they have all these feeder teams, right? And single A, double A, triple A teams. And as players get really good, they'll move into the major league. Uh, and that's the same thing that happens with medium and uh, large houses. Small houses, though, in general are different. If the medium sized publishers like the m minor leagues, small houses, uh, small publishers are like the church softball league. There are no talent scouts in the bleachers, only friends and family. Uh, and this is, I think, a really important distinction. It's, it is, a, in some ways, a completely different game. Medium houses typically are signing new authors. Occasionally, they'll bring up an author from a small house. But once you have sales, right, once you have a sales history, publishers don't care about your platform, hardly at all. Uh, this was kind of a big aha for me when I started agenting. They don't care about your numbers because they have something that's far more meaningful to them, and that, that's your sales history. Because typically, an author's next book will sell similar to their last book. It's not always true. In fact, there's often uh, factors that cause a book to have sales that are low for one particular reason or another. But um, publishers often don't care about those factors. They don't care about the excuses. They just care about how much money that book brought in. And so if your last book only sold 500 copies, they're not going to be interested in you because they're pegging you as an author who only can sell 500 copies. And maybe if you improve your sales by 50% and you get 750 copies sold, that's still not enough to be interesting to them, which is why there are no talent scouts in the bleachers. Because small houses, that's often kind of a typical uh, sales for a book is 500 units, uh, give or take 500, right? So, so some might be selling 1,000 units and some might be selling a few dozen. Um, one way to t tell the difference between a small house and a medium house is by how old it is. It's hard for a small house to stay in business for over a decade. Uh, that charismatic founder runs out of money or runs out of energy or both, and um, they it's, or they find success, right? And so typically, small houses either get bigger and, and transition into a medium house. They've had those hits that fund their operation or they die off in the long run. You know, it's, it's really hard for a small house to stay in business long term. And it's also really hard for them to sell 
Because if you're a charismatic leader uh, and you're doing everything, you don't have much of a business to sell. This is one of the things is somebody who's been in business, went to business school when it comes to exiting, you know, when VC uh, capitalists, venture capitalists are looking at a company uh, to invest in, they're often talking about how will that company exit, right? How can we get our money back and get this big return? And a lot of that has to do with how critical is the founder? The more critical the founder is in the company, the less valuable the company is without that founder. Uh, another way to tell the difference between a medium-sized house and a small house is the size of the advance. If you're getting a triple-digit advance or a double-digit advance, you're working with a small house. I would say even if you're getting you know, $1,500 uh, $1, advance, that's potentially a small house. Uh, so with that kind of explained, I'm going to go through the pros and cons of small houses. And uh, let's start with the pros. The first pro is is that small houses are easier uh, to get picked by, right? They're easier to submit your manuscript. They're less likely to require you uh, to need to get an agent first, although some small houses now still require you to have an agent and only take agented submissions. But again, it depends on the small house. Uh, the gatekeepers are less picky. One of the ways you can tell a small house, actually, is that there's often a submit your book button right on the navigation of the website so large houses have no way to contact them and it's like agented submissions only medium-sized houses might bury it deep in the contact form right they don't want to make it easy to contact them or small houses are desperate for submissions so they make it very big and obvious how to submit your book uh, so this is one of the things i've noticed on their websites Another advantage of small houses is that you get the expertise of that charismatic founder, right? She or he has done a dozen or 50, maybe hundreds of books before yours. And so they have a lot of expertise that they are bringing to the table. And they also have a Rolodex of freelancers that they work with. Uh, and they've already vetted those those freelancers. Again, depending on the size of the house, some really small ones that... Um, charismatic leader is doing a lot of the work, but for some of the kind of larger small houses, they'll bring in cover designers and interior designers, et cetera, uh, to do more and more of the work. And so you're getting the benefit of them vetting those freelancers. Whereas if you're indie, you have to, you have to do that yourself. Uh, there's no money out of pocket. So that, I think this is a key advantage to a small house or traditional publishing, right? It, money only goes one way. Uh, although you are expected to do the marketing, we'll get to that in the cons. So while there's no money out of pocket to publish your book, there is money out of your pocket to sell your book. Uh, there's also prestige in the fact that you're with a traditional royalty paying publisher. Not as much prestige um, amongst insiders, but amongst the general population, you get that prestige. And you also have access to competitions. So a lot of the top awards competitions only are for uh, small publishing houses, medium-sized publishing houses, and large ones, not for indies. Indies are often excluded, uh, partly because they don't pay the money. So these competitions uh, like uh, that, um, you know, if you see a book as an award-winning book, the publisher typically will pay money to have that book submitted to the competition. And since the publishers are paying the money for the competition to work, for the award to work, they're excluding their indie competitors. Um, another pro of small houses is that they sometimes give authors a bigger cut of the royalties, especially for ebooks. Uh, small publishers are often uh, willing to negotiate more generous ebook royalty packages and sometimes a bigger royalty uh, on the print book as well. This often comes at the expense of the advance, but they're a little more flexible uh, because they're not in as strong of a negotiating position. So you're, you're sitting across the table negotiating with somebody who, um, because they're in a weaker position, are willing to make more concessions, which is nice. All right, so let's talk about the small house cons. <laughs> so some of these we've hinted at already. But the biggest kind of fundamental con, and you'll see how it affects all these different areas, is that small publishing houses have a tiny budget. Uh, would, even if your book shows potential, they can't drop $50,000 in promotion to help you hit a bestseller list because they don't have the $50,000 in the bank. Um, they're hand to mouth typically. They're, they do not have millions in the bank to invest on the successes. So kind of another business principle is that you throw good money after good money. You don't throw good money after bad money. So if you see that a book is doing well with the money you've invested in it so far, you invest more money into it. 
Uh, to him who has, more will be given. But you can only give more to him who has if you have the more to give. So small houses don't have that uh, budget to just drop a lot of money and do a, it's like, ooh, we, ha- we have a winner here. This this book's got potential. They can't do anything. Um, they might do a little, but they just don't have the money in the bank. And they've got a lot of other books. And often that charismatic founders is really stretched pretty thin, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of time, right? She's working on the next book and the next book. And she's got the typesetting for this one and the cover for that one to approve. And she's um, like a, it's like a, restaurant with just one person in the kitchen running around trying to do everything another con is that there's a small advance typically it's not uncommon for small presses to offer very small advances i know some that offer a two-digit advance (laughs) so the legally required minimum for it still to be considered uh, an advance Uh, another big uh, con is no audiobook production why because they lack the money (laughs) to make the audiobook they also often lack the expertise to make the audiobook. It's actually easier to get your book made into an audiobook if you're an indie author than it is with if you're with a small press, uh, which is really, really unfortunate because this is the fastest growing, most vibrant part of the market. It's also the highest uh, paying part of the market. Right? Audiobooks are 10 to $15 still. They're holding their value uh, in the market, whereas you know people are expecting to spend two, three, four, five dollars on an ebook, they'll spend twice that on an audiobook, three times that on an audiobook. And another con is that you're still only making seventy-five cents to dollar fifty per paper book. Well, you might be might be getting more money if you're negotiating well with that uh, small house. You're still not making the kind of money on a per book basis that an indie is making because that small house has got to make their money too, right? They've got to earn back their investment. And you lack control over the cover, the typesetting, the marketing, just like you would with a large house. Um, But just like with a large house, you also don't have that marketing data. Uh, While you're expected to spend marketing dollars because they don't have marketing dollars to spend. This is a worst case scenario. With a traditional publishing company, uh, with a big one, while you don't have the data to be able to effectively market your own book it's okay because they have the data and they have the money in there if your book shows potential will drop potentially lots of money on your book i've talked with publishing companies and they're dropping sometimes six digits on their top books to help them be a success right there's a lot of marketing you can do if you're spending a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars to promote the book Uh, They're only doing that with the books that show uh, potential, but they know which books have potential because they have that data and they're using that data. With small houses, they often uh, keep that data to themselves, often because they're using a Kindle, you know, direct publishing, just like an indie would, but they can't give you the data without giving you the data of all their other books. And they don't want to show you how all their other books are selling because that's kind of weird, right, to see other authors' data. And so the result is you don't get marketing data and while still being expected to spend marketing money, which is, um, it's like being expected to drive down the road without being able to see out the windshield. It just doesn't make sense. You, you have to have data to make good decisions. Um, and then related to that, you also can't control the price of your book. So while you are expected to market your book like an indie author, if you're with a small house, you don't have the tools, the data, price control, um, margins, to do that effectively. There are indies. Indie publishing is growing year over year. They're taking away market share in ebooks from traditional publishers. So while traditional publishers are losing market share in ebooks, right? Ebook sales are flat or down for traditional publishers, but they're growing by 20 or 30% year over year for indies. Uh, because they have the data and because they have the margins and because uh, they can control pricing and they can be experimental and aggressive with pricing. With a small house, you don't have any of that. So you have all the cons without any of the pros. Um, Another scary thing, another big con with a small house is that there's no financial stability. They don't have that half a million dollars of evergreen sales coming in the door without really having to do anything for it. And because of that, they're very hand to mouth. They're only a few duds away from closing down altogether. And a lot of small presses go out of business, right? It's not uncommon for a small press to go out of business or quietly go out of business where they're not publishing any new books because they can't afford to do any new books. And so they're just trying to uh, make what they can off the books they've already published. Also, uh, small houses are very dependent on that one person, that charismatic founder. Scandal, sickness, death, um, or even um, 
busyness can uh, take that person. If that person comes out of the picture, all the plates come spinning down. It's kind of like uh, Israel after Solomon died, right? He, he was able to keep dozens of plates spinning simultaneously because he's the wisest man on earth. His son is a fool and is only able to keep two of the plates spinning. The other 10 fall into another kingdom. Uh, so just keep that in mind, right? You want to make sure that that founder is healthy and not going to get a scandal, right? I'm not saying that every small house founder is about to have a scandal or fall over dead, but it is something you want to keep in mind uh, because they're so critical. Whereas with a medium house or a larger house that, you know, the president, in fact, with big houses, it's like a revolving door every um, I'm not going to name any names. So there's certain publishing houses. I feel like every three years, it's a completely different publishing house in terms of staff. It's like the ship of thesis. <laughs> it's like every three years, it's a totally different ship. And every month, they're replacing somebody. And there's almost no one who has uh, continuity in the company. Um, and But they're able to manage that because they're big enough where there's enough other people doing other things where that turnover doesn't make much of a difference. There, there are some di- disadvantages of that turnover, but... They continue to function as a company, partly because when you have all that money coming in from the backlist, it's really hard to go out of business. <laughs> so um, another con of a small house, you get paid slowly, just like in a traditional publisher. It's often the payment terms in terms of how fast you get paid are um, – the same as a traditional publisher. So it's the same con with small houses, with big houses. The difference is, though, sometimes small houses are so strapped for cash, they pay you even slower than the contract calls for them to pay you because the money's just not there. Uh, again, it depends on the publishing house. But that's a big red flag. If they're slow to pay you, right? if you're supposed to be paid in January and you don't get your check until March, uh, it's an indication that they are struggling, struggling to pay the bills. Um, which is not a good sign for the longevity of the company. Uh, Another big downside, and this is what really caused me to do this episode, is that going with a small publisher often prevents you from ever going with a big publisher because they don't have that marketing budget and the expertise and all the other things the bigger publishers have. Your sales are so small, but the fact that those those small sales are with a traditional publisher often makes it almost impossible to get a big publisher interested after you've been with a small press. There are exceptions, and we'll get into some of those exceptions because small publishers do make sense in certain situations. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, but in general, it's such a notable newsworthy event when someone goes from a small press to a medium press or a big press. It's kind of like that person from the church softball team making it into the minor leagues, right? It's all over the papers because it's like a newsworthy event because it's so rare. So it's not that it never happens. It's just that it doesn't happen very often. And there's some publishers small houses where it's never happened right certain small publishers have a track record of of sending people up right it's the uh, church softball team that is right next door to uh, or the uh, one of the scouts for the you know minor league team goes to that church <laughs> and he plays on the softball team and he actually is like hey you might be qualified for the minor leagues right but that's again it's uncommon uh So, like I said before, with most small publishers, you get the worst of traditional publishing and the worst of indie publishing. And in my opinion, small publishing has become the new vanity publishing. It's what people do when they just want to get their name and face on a book and they want the prestige of a traditional publisher. They um, And they're like, I don't want to do indie publishing because it doesn't give me the prestige that I want. Uh, They go with uh, small publishing. Uh, So, but with that said, small presses are not always a bad idea. So let's talk about when small publishers make sense, when a small publishing house makes sense. And the first time it makes sense is when that small publisher has a strong focused brand. And a good example of this is Enclave Publishing. They just do Christian speculative fiction, fantasy and sci-fi. That's it. And that strong focused brand has created fans of Enclave. Enclave has its own email list of fans who want to buy Enclave's books. And they do have a track record of sending people to the big league, so to speak. In fact, I on my other podcast, Novel Marketing, I recently interviewed Nadine Brandis, who started off as an Enclave author writing Christian speculative fiction uh, for Enclave. And now she's writing speculative fiction for HarperCollins. So she's gone all the way to the top. Uh, another example of when a small publisher makes sense and, and I really like this example. And this is something I didn't even know existed until I went to the ECPA 
um, conferences, this conference of all the publishing executives, right? The presidents and vice presidents. And I sat down at dinner with a guy who ran a small press for a mega church. So I won't give the name of the mega church, but we're talking tens of thousands of people on Sunday and um, satellite churches that were in their kind of network of churches, either where they would show the pastor on the screen or they had had their own pastor, but they were uh, aligned. They were an affiliated church and they only printed books by staff of either the main church or one of their satellite network churches. And so I was talking to him about his book sales. He's like, yeah, typically we can expect about 5,000 sales of any book we publish. But if the pastor mentions it from the stage, we typically get 30 to 35,000 sales. Those are really good numbers. <laughs> Those are really good numbers. And they don't have any duds, basically, because they have this passionate following. And they have access to exclusive bookstores, right? When you walk into that mega church, what books do you see? You know, when you're walking through the coffee shop, you see books by that church's publisher. And they're making really good margins because they're not just the publisher, they're also the retailer. So you buy your coffee on your way into church and you buy the book by the pastor or by the youth pastor or by whoever else the staff person is. That kind of small publisher makes total sense. If you're a staff person for that church and you're writing a book on Christian living, man, I would go with that publisher before anything else because going with them and having it, you get exclusive access to their passionate following of congregants, people who walk into that church, but you're still on Amazon. You're still, um, you know, people can still buy your book through all of the other traditional channels. So that makes a lot of sense if, if that's the kind of um, strategy. And, and that small publisher will transition and may already be arguably a medium-sized publisher, especially as they get older, because that many base hits. And, right, and when you always walk up and get a base hit, sometimes you'll accidentally get a home run. <laughs> so if you're that good of a batter. Uh, another time when a small publisher makes sense, and this is an opportunity for those of you listening, because I haven't seen this done much in Christian publishing, but it's uh, very popular in secular publishing. And that's where the publisher controls a literary universe that all of the writers in that publisher get to write in. So a literary universe is like a print version of a cinematic universe, right? So if you watch Marvel movies, Iron Man will fly into Captain America's movie, right? Because they're all in the same universe. The Guardians of the Galaxy will land on Earth and suddenly they're helping the Avengers fight off the big bad guy. Uh, that's uh, really popular right now, connecting books in a common literary universe where characters will go from one book to another. It's been happening in comic books for 50, 80 years. Um, you know, Marvel Comics shared uh, a, a universe long before their movies did, right? So you never knew when Spider Man was going to swing onto the page of an X Men book, a comic book. Um, and this is actually really lucrative, right? Because if somebody's a really passionate fan of the literary universe that they're reading, right? They love the main characters, and there's another book by a different author, but with some of the same characters that they love in the books that they're reading, it's a really easy sell. And it's a really easy way to introduce yourself to new readers by writing in that shared literary universe. An example of this in uh, secular publishing is the publisher Sterling and Stone, uh, which started off as a handful of indie authors, and they became so profitable <laughs> that they started their own publishing company, their own small house that's focused around just books in their literary universes. And they, I think they have several different literary universes uh, that they manage. And they have a whole process that they approach it. They, they almost approach it more like a... Um, TV show uh, where you have different writers in like a writing room and, you know, certain people who do certain tasks and it's more of a factory. Uh, it's a very innovative model. And I think that there's room in Christian publishing for that model. I think two or three companies could very easily make very good money copying the Sterling and Stone model. Um, but that that's another instance when going with a small publisher could make sense for you. Uh, so, uh, so that's when small publishing makes sense because of things special about the small publishing house. There's also some times going with a small publisher can make sense because certain things with the author. So uh, if the author is successful in one genre and known for one genre and wants to write a book in a second separate genre under a pen name, 
right? So there's very little risk here. You you already have a good relationship with your big publishing house, but you want to do something totally different, right? You're known for romance. You've been writing, or let's say you're known for Amish, right? And you're writing some really popular Amish books and you want to, you've got the sci-fi book that's on your heart and it just won't get away. And you feel like you can't really focus on your next Amish book till you write that sci-fi book. You don't want to write that sci-fi book with your normal publisher. You don't want to write it with your normal name, but you want to get it out there. A small house could make sense for that. You don't have to learn any publishing, right? Cause learning any publishing for just one book like that's not worth it. And this book isn't meant to fund your family or change the world. You just want to get it out there. In that instance, going with a small house uh, could make sense. And it would be a really easy sell. That small house would be very happy to publish you under a pen name, potentially. Um, if you have just one book that you want to write and you can't afford to independently publish, small house could make sense. The learning curve of independent publishing really starts to pay off on the second book, right? Because that first book, learning curve is so high that uh, it's a lot of work to learn all the things you have to learn. But here's the thing. When you write the second book, you already know all the things you learned writing the first book. And so, uh, but if you're only writing one book, like you have the one book that God put in your heart, you want to write it and you want to get it out there. That's not very attractive to big publishers. They're, they're wanting a long-term relationship with you. In fact, often in the contract, there's a right of first refusal on your next book. Uh, but a small publisher would be happy to publish that one book, right? Your magnum opus. Um, another reason why a small publisher could make sense is if you're not concerned about the money, the sales, or the impact of the book. You just want to get it out there. Again, this is kind of more of a vanity motivation, but maybe you're a speaker and there's certain speaking gigs you can only get if you're traditionally published. And so the whole purpose of this book isn't to change the world or to sell lots of copies or make an impact. It's just to unlock that door for you. You, you, you know, it's a binary. Are you traditionally published? Yes, no. You have to have the traditional published book to get you know into this conference you really want to speak at. A situation like that, a small publisher could make sense. Um, and then another reason is if you want access to that focus group of fans that the small publisher has. So in the three examples that I shared, you know, the Enclave, the Megachurch Press, and Sterling and Stone, each of those small publishing approaches, what they have in common is that they have a focused group of passionate fans, right? People are like, I've read 20 books in this uh, literary universe, and I re read every other book that comes out the day it comes out because I'm so passionate about this literary universe, or I'm such a passionate member of this church, I buy every book that church's uh, press puts out. Uh, if you want access to that group, it's when it makes a lot of sense. So uh, for most authors who are considering a small press, I recommend not going with a small press, unless you're one of those things I just mentioned. Uh, so while I was very neutral on indie as opposed to traditional publishing, I'm not very neutral on small presses. If for most authors, I think it's a mistake. I think it's a vanity play. Not always and not for all presses, but uh, for the majority, uh, I feel this way partly because I've talked with so many authors. So many people come to Novel Marketing, my other podcast, just discouraged because they went with a small press and now they feel trapped. They, they can't get anybody to talk to them. Agents won't talk to them. Publishers won't talk to them because their numbers are so bad. And they're basically forced to go indie. <laughs> and they didn't know that. No one told them, oh, yeah, if you go with a small press, there's a 95% chance that you will only be able to go indie after that. And the small press isn't doing anything for their book while simultaneously keeping them from doing anything from their book because they don't have the data and they don't have the margins. And they don't have the price control. And, and they're just very frustrated. And so if you're going to go with a small press, it's very important that you go with your eyes wide open. <laughs> you know what the risks are and you know what they bring to the table and what they don't bring to the table. And often for just a little bit of education. And we have a great course in the Christian Writers Institute that walks you through independent publishing done the right way by a very successful independent publisher. In fact, if you look at uh, the Kindle, the Kalytix report for Christian fiction. So we had Alex on here several episodes ago, you know, giving a report of Kindle sales. The top selling authors were Indie and Kindle. And then the second best selling authors were traditionally published the with big houses. And there was, I don't, I didn't see on the report a single small house author that made the top list. Uh, they're just not there, right? So indies are very successful in ebooks, primarily. They're not as successful in paper. Uh, and traditional published authors are really successful in paper and they also make money in ebooks. But the, uh, 
the small presses, they just aren't there. They're, they're not making lots of sales. They're not changing the world with their books. And I think it's important to know that. Now, I will say, there's lots of traditional published authors who aren't there either, right? It's not like you're guaranteed to be a success if you go indie. There's lots of indies who are struggling. There's lots of you know big house authors who are struggling. Um, but it is nice to know that there's at least a path, right? That there's at least some people who are succeeding if you take that path. Uh, whereas with small houses, um, it's much, much harder. Uh, our course of the week, this is your last chance. Uh, oh, sorry. A sponsor is the Christian Writers Institute, and the course of the week is our agent bundle. <laughs> so somebody who can help you navigate publishing houses and knows the good ones from the bad ones, right? Which small houses have a passionate following and which small houses don't. Uh, this is where having a literary agent really helps. And also, it's the only way to go with uh, the big houses. The big ones will only talk to literary agents now. So if you're wanting help with literary agents for the next three or four days, depending on when you hear this, uh, you have a chance to get the uh, Christian Writers Institute's agent bundle. It's a brand new bundle. It's normally $80, $80 dollars but it's 70% off for the month of October. And it's got all of our best courses on getting an agent and also on becoming a better writer. So you really owe it to yourself uh, to grab this course before uh, the discount ends. And, and I strongly recommend um, pursuing this because working with an agent is really key, I feel, if you're going the traditional route. If you're going indie, you don't need an agent. But if, if you are thinking about going traditional, you need to start talking with agents. Even if you decide to go indie down the road, uh, talking with an agent now is really useful. In fact, there's a special way of going indie uh, called Amazon White Glove. It's only um, available to authors who are with agents <laughs> uh, or who have sold like a million dollars worth of books. So if you're Stephen King, you can get White Glove on your own. Uh, but this is where Amazon does a lot of the work for you as you indie publish. And so it's in some ways, it's the best of both worlds because you get all the advantages of indie publishing while simultaneously getting a lot of the advantages of traditional publishing <laughs> because Amazon does your typesetting and they even will help you find a cover designer and they'll pay for it sometimes. Uh, so that's White Glove. Um, and it's a, it's a reason at least to talk to an agent. Not all agents do wh White Glove and it's not necessarily a good idea because you still don't get the data. Um, the agent gets the data, you don't get the data. So actually, if you're truly going indie, I still I would recommend just go straight indie. Uh, don't do any of these hybrid things. Uh, and always ask, do I get real-time sales data? Because without that, you are driving down the road without a windshield. Uh, let me know what you think uh, of this episode. I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is a little more controversial episode, but be nice in the comments, uh, especially to people who disagree with you. Um, and, you know, if you've had a good experience with a small publisher, do feel free uh, to share that. I'd, I'd love to hear those small press uh, positive experiences. And if you've had a bad experience with a small press, feel free to share that in the comments as well. I'm Thomas Umstadt. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to The Christian Publishing Show. For more information and to get episodes delivered to your phone automatically, visit christianpublishingshow.com.